No Longer Silent, Patient Access Stories. It's very short-sighted to put in place these types of hoops that elderly patients have to jump through. It's not putting the patient first. Today, we're getting loud with a family, and our patient is Rosemary Blashill. She's a retired nurse and rheumatoid arthritis patient. She is joined today by her daughter, Lisa, and her husband, Jim. Thank you so much, Lisa and Rosemary, for joining me this afternoon. You are our first mother-daughter duo for our No Longer Silent Patient Access campaign, and we are honored to have you here. Is either of you a Black woman? No. Are you a breast cancer survivor? No. Have you been diagnosed with any cancer? No. No. So you're not a Black woman. You haven't been diagnosed with breast cancer. Tell me today why you said yes to joining this campaign of no longer silent patient access issues. I've worked in nursing for, what, 50, 60 years, and I also worked at the health department for 20 years. And we we find all kinds of people that are met by expenses they can't pay, and that was kind of a common theme for the health department is that people don't have money to buy what they need. If I can add, after all of those years of service to the community and people with needs like that, my mom retired with an insurance plan that she, you know, had earned through her work in that um, industry, in that health department for all of those years and lost her insurance at the age of 81 after, you know, a decision was made by a subsequent group of elected officials to change the benefits that retirees receive after she retired. And so she had to um, go on to a Medicare Advantage plan, which um, has, has created a, um, a barrier for her in receiving the medication that she needs to treat her long time rheumatoid arthritis because of the high out-of-pocket costs that she's responsible for with this new insurance plan. Wow. Wow. So you're perfect for this conversation because that is exactly what we are talking about. American citizens who have dedicated some portion of their lives to making sure that our society and our communities are healthier and safer and better and then find themselves not even able to receive the type of healthcare support that they need. So Lisa, you alluded to Rosemary's high out-of-pocket costs. Can you tell me a little bit more about those out-of-pocket costs, Rosemary? Uh, We pay $75, I think it is, to see any specialist. Every time you go, you pay this $75. We pay $30 for every physical therapy visit you have, Uh, $30 for an acupuncturist, a um, massage person, we pay that that kind of money for that. And then for meds, like I have one eye drop that I pay $105 for. And what was the other one? Oh, Orencia, like my last insurance paid for me to go to the hospital and get my rheumatoid med once a month. And I think they were charged about 16000 for that. Not that they paid that, but that's what the charge was. And now I just can't do that. This insurance doesn't really cover it. Do you want to share, Mom, your calculation that you did of your six months worth of out-of-pocket expenses? Yes. And this, this doesn't relate just to arthritis, but it's the six months of medical expenses for the past six months. And so we came up with $8,120. And this would have been, because we started last June with uh, this Medicare program priority. And uh, so since then, we have ourselves paid out $8,120 for six months. And if we were extend that to a full year, it would be 16000 $240. $240. And so that is in addition to your insurance premium that you pay to have medical coverage. Yes. How do you afford that? Uh, piece by piece and try try to, well, I don't take Arencia at the moment because unless I can get it from a doctor free, 
she will give me some, but I live at Travers and we have to drive to Petoskey to pick up those injections. And I might get three, I might get four. And it used to be you had to take the eye, the intramuscular one, uh, one time a week. But that has changed because people can't pay for it. So she she has a group of us that she's collecting it for. But we have to go out to once every two weeks now because there's not enough there's not enough of it for us. Yeah. How long is that drive? Uh, an hour and a half. An hour. It can be two hours depending mm-hmm. on the weather and the traffic. One way. One way. And you have to spend five hours a week just to go get medication because your insurance does not cover it. Yes. And I'd have to cover up. We don't go once a week because she doesn't have that much. And so we go once every two weeks or whatever we can, whenever she calls and says it's ready. Not only bundle my 82-year-old now self up, mm-hmm. but I also bundle up my husband to go with me. So oh. it's two of us 82-year-olds. And are you making that drive? My husband drives most of the time. Does your husband experience any discomfort with with the driving? Uh, Sure. He's right over here, too. Jim? Um, Not particularly. It's uh, it's a fairly long drive. It depends on the weather and stuff. I I do have a driver's license, too. (laughs) They gave you a driver's license? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Are you old enough to drive? Yeah. Yeah. Just keep it under your (laughs) hat. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining the conversation, Jim. We're just chatting about, you know, the discomfort and the impact that not being able to get the necessary medications for Rosemary's rheumatoid arthritis that it's having on your family and on your expenses, you know, the financial burden. Do you want to chime in and share anything about that? It's a yes. lot of money. <laughs> it's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they, they pulled a plug on our insurance for whatever reason. If you had to say something to a policymaker about, you know, they pulled the plug on the insurance, what would you say to that policymaker about laws that need to be created to help patients be able to use their insurance that they pay for? to get medications that they need? Well, for one thing, it's the arbitrariness of of the decision. Certainly was um, an issue. Personally, I like the one pay. You know, I think everybody should have Medicare. I mean, like most of the world. So I think we can afford that as a country. That's what I tell them. And what about you, Rosemary? I would probably stand in front of them a little bit longer and (laughs) keep telling them that if they're not going to think about these things, it's no use of them being policy makers. So they have to include everybody and they have to go out and do exactly what you're doing is get it from the, every kind of a person out there that has a need. They should be listening to them, not sitting in the, the chambers, you know, but be out talking to people and finding out what people really need. That's good. So Lisa, as the daughter, um, what impact is this having on you watching your, we we call them, you know, in in our culture, we we call them seasoned (laughs) persons in their lives, um, having to, to, to battle this crisis. Yeah. So um, I share um, a similar background to my mother um, in that I have spent over 30 years in a career uh, dedicated to nursing and public health. And so I've seen many patients in this situation and, um, you know, always felt that my parents were very fortunate. They worked hard um, at their long careers of service and were able to retire with um, with a good insurance plan, which many people don't have. And so, um, you know, they, they certainly were very fortunate in that. I am extremely disappointed in the Medicare Advantage plan um, that they have now and the way that it's set up 
which is the option that most people in retirement have to turn to. And so as their advocate, um, you know, well, certainly as their daughter, it's very disappointing to see that they even have to struggle with this at their age when they should be enjoying the, you know, this time in their life and um, be able to be free from the stress and worry that comes along with this. My mom over the years has, I mean, she's had rheumatoid arthritis since she was 35 years old. She has fought hard through that disease, um, you know, worked an entire career, was very productive. And so it's really disappointing to see now that she can't get the treatment that she needs. After many years of having an illness like that, the medications that they use to treat it over time start failing. And so because she's had it for so long and because she's been treated for so long, there are many medications that just don't work any longer. Mm -hmm. Um, So this really, this Arencia is really her only choice. She's either had a treatment failure or an adverse reaction to all of the other choices. So it's not like there's a less expensive option. And the, the Medicare Advantage plan is set up as such that it has a tiered system of copays and um, out of, for, that addresses their out-of-pocket costs. So to get to the level where medications like this are covered, they call it catastrophic coverage. To get to catastrophic coverage, they have to pay, they're subject to certain costs. Um, and for them, the total cost for a two-month supply of this medication is $11,000. And in the first two tiers that she has to progress through to get to this catastrophic tier, she's responsible for paying $8,000 in one category and $5,000 in another category. And although they're exclusive categories, they're accumulated. So she has to meet both of them before that medication can be covered. So you can see 8,000 and 5,000 is 13,000. It's more than the cost of her initial dose of medication. So it's literally impossible for her to get the medication. Um, And it would be for most people, I think. I don't think most people would have that kind of money to pay for a medication like that unless her doctor provides samples, which she has kindly been doing, but she has to ration them among her patients. She's a rheumatologist and she has many patients in the same situation. And so it's difficult. Oh my goodness. I mean, you just laid out copay um, accumulator atrocity um, that is supposed to be something that's helpful to us. It's disguised as something that's helpful to us, but uh, actually it hurts the patient. And so Rosemary, when you were laying out your numbers initially, um, I thought those numbers were bad, that you've paid out 8,000 over the past six months. However, to hear that you would have to pay almost 13,000 every other month if you were actually going through your insurance to get the medication. Are are there times that you go without the medication and you need it? Yes, I've gone lots of weeks without it. it. And that's the kind of treatment you really can't do. It should be on a regular basis in order to keep the arthritis at bay. Yeah. yeah. What so, is your quality of life like when you're without your medication? Uh, certainly more so, less able to do things. Mm-hmm. And uh, some have said that my occipital neuralgia comes from arthritis. I don't know, but it certainly has changed my quality of life. Jim, how is that for you? It certainly has limited our ability to do things outside the house yeah. uh, we, we try to do you know, we try to walk every day um, being in Florida here it's much easier than Michigan certainly yeah. but uh, very 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 often we have to do kind of when we make plans to do things we have to kind of consider Rosemary's condition and whether she's able to get through say a four or five or six hour event or whatever it is and it does affect us on a daily basis so mm-hmm. yes yeah their days are definitely planned around pain control. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of things that they don't do that they would like to do um, because it's hard to tolerate. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I am trying to not be furious. We hear uh, every, every conversation we have 
with the patient around some form of patient access issues. The stories are just unimaginable. And so it is our hope and it's our goal that we um, spread this campaign far and wide and that it gets to the places that it needs to get to. I get to go into rooms with policymakers in here in the Capitol in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C., and I am fueled even further by stories like yours. So just know the reason I ask you questions like, what would you say to a policymaker is because maybe you won't get in front of one, but I do. And I can be your voice. And I'm honored to share your story and share the pain and anguish that persons like yourself, persons who are uninsured, that's a whole different category. But you worked your entire life to position yourself to be able to really enjoy the fruits of your labor at this season in your life. Mm -hmm. And instead, you suffer in pain daily to a certain extent unnecessarily simply because you can't have access to the medication because of the cost. Right. That is not only unbelievable, but it's unacceptable. Lisa, I turn to you and ask you, if you were in front of a policymaker, what would you have to say about your mom's situation? I would say that it, in turn, um, likely increases the health problems that she has and likely increases healthcare costs. It's very short-sighted and it's very wrong to put in place these types of hoops that elderly patients people over 65 that have Medicare have to jump through to get access to the medication that they need. It's not putting the patient first. It is certainly not focused on a goal of um, successful treatment of these conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, It feels almost as if they're trying not to pay for it. (laughs) They often advertise that you can turn to the patient assistance foundations from pharmaceutical companies, which I have been working on with my mom's doctor, who this is agonizing for her doctor as well. You know, she's having to try and take care of all of these patients who need the same medication and ration doses between them, make recommendations that she knows are not the ideal recommendations, um, having to spread it out biweekly versus weekly. And so, you know, it, it puts everyone in a, in a very difficult situation when the doctor knows the way the treatment should be administered and the patient knows how to take the medication and is willing to do their part um, to have their disease treated. It is really in the hands of the the insurance companies and their regulators. And so um, I'm not sure who's benefiting from this, but it's certainly not the patient, certainly not the doctor. We want to pause for a moment to thank our platinum partner, Amgen. Amgen has been a consistent partner who not just talks the talk, they fight hard to illuminate voices and experiences of diverse patients. We're truly thankful for such a beautiful partnership. This conversation is also activated by Genentech and Change for Sean. Thank you to all of our partners. You know, my mom and dad have worked all of their lives. They have an income that allows them to live fairly comfortably in retirement. Certainly not excessive by any means. It's a fixed income, um, but it provides for their basic needs. But even at that income level, they are considered well over income for assistance from the pharmaceutical company because they have all of these other out-of-pocket costs, which to me demonstrate a financial hardship. We appealed that decision and just received this week a denial of that claim. The reason that they gave was that their out-of-pocket costs didn't exceed 3% of their annual gross income. However, they're only considering year to date. It's only February. We'll never get to the point where she gets access to her medications if those are what the rules are. Oh my goodness. So, you know, what I would say to policymakers is um, please learn what these what these terms really mean to the patients, copay accumulators, catastrophic coverage, um, because in reality, it, it, it doesn't benefit the patient. In the end, they never actually get access to that benefit mm-hmm. unless they have that cash to pay up front. Yeah. So I know I didn't know that, you know, uh, right. so I think that 
it takes some really important self-education and reflection to really understand what these plans are offering patients. Uh, (laughs) I'm actually speechless because this actually just makes no sense. When you say you don't know who it benefits, but you know it's not benefiting the patient and it's not benefiting the doctors, well, there's only a few people left. (laughs) And so those are the people that already have billions of dollars and make billions of dollars annually, really at the expense of patients like Rosemary. And it makes me think, you know, you know, Lisa, you and I do different work outside of this, but it also makes me think of even more ways to provide the awareness and education around these issues, um, even if it's potentially like just creating posters with a one-liner to a policymakers. Learn what these terms mean. I, I had never heard of catastrophic coverage. Yeah. And you know, when I called the, the insurance company to understand their plan, I asked, you know, because like you know, through my, my employer in the past or my husband's employer, we're able to select, you know, a higher level plan or a lower level plan, or you can select a high deductible plan. Retirees don't have that choice with these Medicare Advantage plans. This is it. You know, yeah. I said, can they pay a higher premium to get a better plan? And the answer was no. This yeah. is these are the choices that they have. And I mean, Congress has been for the past several years, even working to slash, you know, the Medicare Advantage plans as they already are. They're they're looking at cutting back even further. So where's the hope? How I mean, I, we started this conversation and um, I you you just lit up my heart and my spirit with both of your bright smiles. And Jim, you came into the conversation and you have stood by your wife during this conversation. You you obviously find hope somewhere. Where where do you find the hope? Well, that there's a change of policy somewhere, you know, nationally probably, uh, somehow um, a more reasonable uh, approach. It's just crazy when you have to, you know, you have to put a fair amount of your income or your your uh, retirement retirement money and whatever in, into uh, into into meds. It's just crazy. I think I don't know. I, I hope it changes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about you, Lisa? Where do you find hope? Uh, you know, I find hope in um, the doctors who care and who you know. My mom's doctor and her staff have been phenomenal um, about helping her to apply for these assistance programs, to look at different treatment options. Um, so I, I, I hope that the lawmakers will listen to the providers who are trying to provide care under these conditions. You know, thank goodness that we have her. Um, she's amazing and um, she's trying to do the best she can, but the conditions that we're putting upon our doctors who are dedicated to treating patients with these complicated conditions um, are really, are really suffering too. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also find hope in, you know, the, the folks that that work at the patient assistance foundation um, for the insurance companies certainly hear all of these stories. Um, You know, they, they try to give you the best information that they can to help you jump through the hoops that are placed in front of you and to successfully achieve, you know, successful treatment for your illness. But um, I know that they also are kind of plagued by these regulatory conditions that maybe aren't regulating quite well enough. (laughs) (laughs) That should be on a a t-shirt. Are your (laughs) Regulations regulating. <laughs> what are we regulating here? You know, yeah, right, right. <laughs> and, and what about you, Rosemary? Where do you find hope? Well, first of all, I find hope in these two. <laughs> <laughs> and next in your organization, I am excited that somebody's going to go before the policymakers in it. I think seeing you tells me that you're going to do it well. Absolutely. And so the sooner you can get there, the better. <laughs> well, I, I'm scheduled to be there in May, so I hope that's <laughs> enough. But I'm scheduled to be in D.C. in May. So I oh, hope that's wonderful. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, don't you don't you leave your seat there till you tell them everything, okay? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I will say, Miss Rosemary said, "I have time on the floor. Forget your clock." <laughs> <laughs> That's I true. have something to tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you all have been so wonderful. Thank you for your time today. We try to end on a lighter note because these conversations are so heavy sometimes. And so we try to end on a lighter note. I don't go ask questions as as deeply as Larry King. You know, he oh. ends his interview, he has this long series of, I don't make them that thought provoking, but I ask you a few questions. Um, uh, about what do you prefer? Um, and so one or all of you can answer the question. Um, day or night? Day. Day. Sure. <laughs> Whatever they want. <laughs> That's a sign of a smart man. You hold on to him, Mary. <laughs> That's a truth. <laughs> Chocolate or vanilla? Yeah. Vanilla. Oh, chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> chocolate. Chocolate. Breakfast or dinner? Breakfast. Dinner. Breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, and I'd love for all three of you uh, to, to answer. We'll we'll start with you, Jim. Go to Lisa and then Rosemary. You will be the final. What brings you joy? My family. My family. My family. <laughs> <laughs> three for three. <laughs> Three, four, three. I absolutely love it. Well, um, I would love to, an opportunity to have Carrie's Touch provide breakfast because it was two to one. I'm sorry, Lisa. But your your next opportunity to go for breakfast or even when you have to make that ridiculous drive again, um, <laughs> Carrie's Touch would love to treat you to breakfast. Okay. Treat you to uh, breakfast. So I will connect with Lisa on how we will do that sure. and oh, go from there. But thank you from the bottom of my heart. I am so grateful for you sharing and trusting me with your story. And I promise you, I promise you that when I am in front of the legislators, I will share your story as well as the story of others. And I'll leave you with this um, African proverb that says, until the lion tells the story, the story will always be told by the hunter. Mm. Wow. So we are telling the lion stories. Rosemary, Lisa, and Jim, this was a single conversation that turned into a family conversation. And it is so crucial for a family to be involved and to be able to navigate and share the load of just trying to get the medications that you need. And especially when you feel like you've done everything right and to still be in this position. Thank you so much for sharing your story that heals. And I promise you, Rosemary, every time I speak to a legislator, your words are gonna ring true in the back of my mind that are fueling me to fight for patients and patients' rights. Thank you all, blessings to you. Thank you to renowned virtual photographer, John Keatley and his incredible team. A special thanks to photos by A Love LLC, April Jones, retouch artist, and to the dedicated Carrie's Touch tribe for your unwavering support in helping us create stories that heal. And another big thank you to our platinum sponsor, Amgen. For more information about these stories and other survivor support and advocacy information, visit us at our website at www.carriestouch.org.